Have you ever had that friend that repeatedly does that one thing that is super annoying and perhaps even detrimental to their own lives and those around them and that no matter how many times you guide them onto the path of redemption, they can't help but commit yet another walk of shame and fall off the line for the rest of eternity? Not only have I had that friend, but I also have been that friend. And let me tell you, it ain't pretty on either end. But why do I bring this up now? One of my favorite franchises of all time has had this exact problem for more than half of my existence on this planet. But in recent years, there seems to have finally been a shift in the paradigm. And when this shift became clear to me, it was one of the most euphoric sensations I've experienced on planet Earth. Hello there soap shoe enthusiasts, I'm Ryder CX and today we are of course talking about the legend, the icon, the chili dog connoisseur himself, Sonic the Hedgehog. What we're honing in on specifically is one aspect of the Sonic the Hedgehog universe that I can confidently say after years of slipping and sliding in the sweatshop, Sega seems to finally get what to do with it. So what I'm going to go through is what this specific aspect is, why Sega had no clue what to do with it since before I even got into this franchise, and what they changed in the last couple of years to bring Sonic to what I firmly believe is going to be another peak for him not quite seen since the early days. And just because I'm feeling a little goofy, near the end of this video, I am going to explain a pathway that Sega could have kept going down that would have resulted in a very different looking franchise using the downfall of Katy Perry. I know this sounds so unserious, but you'll just have to stick with me because the dish I'm cooking today is, well, well done. Before we get started though, I just wanted to point out this video was spurred by Channel Pup's video on the same subject, how Shadow Generations fixes Sonic's marketing problem. I watched this video and honestly felt extremely seen, so huge shout out to him, he's a great creator. I wanted to give my own spin on the prompt though, as I think I still have a few dishes I could cook for the after party. So before we get into the heart of the matter, I want to take you back to when the man first landed on the moon. When Sonic first debuted in the early 90s, there was a clear intentional goal with the marketing of this brand new character. In an era where there was one dominating force of nature, in the console mascot fighting ring, Sega knew they had to go harder and faster to get the edge that they've been desperately needing. And thus was the birth of Sonic the Hedgehog, a cheesy spiky blue ball that was designed to directly antagonize the weaknesses of Nintendo's own Mario. I mean, watching back some of these commercials now, you certainly get a sense of that classic 90s cheese that you secretly love. Admit it. While I didn't grow up with Sonic during this time period, looking back on it, I got a clear sense of who Sonic was and what his purpose entailed. He may have been a colorful protagonist like Mario, but he was coated in a paint of edge, adventure, and high speed stakes. And in each of the classic games, the environments would morph from easy going naturalistic paradises into industrial nightmares that echoed the threats of Dr. Robotnik. Even without the use of voice acting or scripting, Sonic has always positioned his games to have so much more on the line beyond a princess being kidnapped. Sonic was all about saving the world, preserving nature, and preventing huge sources of power from being misused. And in each game that came afterwards, more and more of this lore was built on as the Chaos Emeralds became more prominent and multiple characters were introduced each with different personalities and roles in the universe. And I will say throughout the 90s, though Sonic did have some less than stellar titles come out, this sense of self was very prominent, all the way up to the adventure games where I personally believe Sega truly peaked with the portrayal and marketing of Sonic. Many people would like you to believe that the adventure games presented a complete shift in the narrative and world building of Sonic games, but no, 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 that is not in the slightest bit true, and here's why. As we mentioned before, what characterized Sonic in the early 90s was attitude and high stakes, and the adventure games provided exactly that. What throws people off is probably the inclusion of humans and realistic looking environments versus the cartoony aesthetic of the classic games. But it's not like the classic games were void of any realistic looking environments either, Sonic has always been at his best weaving in a bit of both, and Adventure 1 at least did a great job at this. And when we turn our attention to the attitude and high stakes of Sonic, both adventure games absolutely excel at this and if anything, push the envelope as much as they can in both departments. Sonic's attitude feels a little more mature compared to say Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog, but he still has a cheesy confidence to him and a voice direction that echoes a more grown up version of who Sonic came out speeding as. To me, the adventure games more so represented a natural evolution for Sonic thanks to the onset of the technology the Dreamcast offered. Sonic has always tried to push the stakes of his narrative in the ways that he could and the fact that the Dreamcast was as powerful as it was for its time basically mandated Sonic to 
leap in his own way. But as we all know, Saik has certainly garnered a ringer in terms of his image from this point on, and now we unfortunately have to dissect from a marketing perspective just what exactly went wrong. I believe that Sega in general was shaken to its core from having to exit the console market. I mean, think about it. You've experienced years of unprecedented success and then suddenly have what feels like the sharpest decline of history that leads to you being kicked out of the console market? I mean, that would be my villain origin story too. When you're in a state of confusion, just overall feeling lost, a lot of things can change and Sonic was probably the ultimate representation of how Sega would continue with their own internal management going forward. When it comes to Sonic though, he was of course transitioning from iconic console mascot to hopefully noteworthy third party franchise. And it was in this period, Sega was really trying to see what Sonic has to do to climb back to the top of the food chain as he was essentially their only claim to relevancy at this point. So this era of Sonic that lasts a lot longer than you think is what I like to call Sonic's Arrows era. So what do I mean by this? Besides the fact that I'm going to see Tales of in October! What I mean by this is that Sonic will essentially be spending the next two decades or so trying out all sorts of different costumes, personalities, and aesthetics in an effort to appeal Sonic to the masses according to the fluctuating trends. Sonic Heroes to me is the last Sonic game to help capture Sonic's true essence in a sense before the series begins with Sonic's first reincarnation, a superbly try-hard edgelord that thought it was at Final Fantasy levels of lore and darkness. This era is characterized by games like Shadow the Hedgehog and Sonic 06. This is essentially what people think the adventure games are like. A very serious and gritty tone backed by extensive monsters of the week meant to instill the biggest of stakes in Terra ever seen in a Sonic game. As someone who grew up loving Sonic during this era, I can still see some of the appeal of this portion of Sonic's career. I mean yes, the gameplay was certainly far from stellar, but these games felt similar to the adventure ones in terms of pushing the boundaries of Sonic and also upping the stakes. However, these games are also borrowing from what was popping off at the time, which was first person shooters. Shadow the Hedgehog is obviously the most over overt example of this, giving Shadow guns and vehicles and making him cuss. The use of aliens certainly does echo Halo's sensibilities in particular. While Sonic 06 toned down the use of guns and vehicles, it certainly still took that same tone from Shadow and tried to make it bigger and bolder. In an era where it seems the best selling games were these dark M rated games, Sega certainly tried to squeeze Sonic the Hedgehog into that extremely small and tight opening. As we all know though, this absolutely backfired for Sonic and unfortunately led to a new low for Sonic that people cannot help but continuously referenced even two decades later. I hate it here. So if we move on to Sonic's next reinvention, this is what I like to call the exact opposite of whatever the fuck that last era was. Sonic Unleashed was a transitional game for them as it was likely in development during 06 and was likely retooled to be much more akin to this next era of Sonic by the time the final product was out. But Sonic Colors would serve as the true beginning of a pivot for Sonic that would last far too long and here's how I would best describe it. Sega smoked the fumes of the people that were calling the adventure games far too drastic of a pivot from what Sonic originally was, it in turn transformed Sonic into what these imbeciles thought Sonic always was. I will give them credit that color certainly has similarities to Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog at least, but overall the true essence of how Sonic was had been lost in favor of a tone and setup that was void of the edgy, too cool for school like personality and world building people had initially fallen in love with. This only expanded upon itself with time all the way up to Sonic Lost World which to me, felt like the absolute peak in the atrocity that was this direction. Barely any realism from the adventure games were left, the stakes were the lowest they've been for a Sonic game thanks to the joke that was the Deadly Six, and it also didn't help that the game controlled like a poor man's version of Mario Galaxy. And that's when it dawned on me. This era should have actually been called the Mario era, as Sega put a lot of things into place into making Sonic as similar to his once rival as possible. And this is honestly the most ironic thing I am going to talk about in this video. What was once a franchise that prided itself in being marketed as the exact opposite of the biggest thing in gaming was now desperately trying to appeal to its audience because Sega believed Sonic had lost its appeal completely. Sonic was further than he'd ever been before from his core essence and that was showing in the numbers. It also didn't help that Sega sign a 3 game exclusivity deal for Nintendo's flop console that was the Wii U, which I still love very much just so everyone is aware. But once Sega saw that the love for Sonic was beginning to dry up despite a couple critically praised games, they 
took the mimicking Mario strategy and just began to mimic everything else. This is what I'm going to call the clone era, as practically every mainline Sonic game coming out from this point on was trying to mimic a whole different franchise and aesthetic. First up is the debacle that was Sonic Boom. I really don't know if they were mimicking a certain franchise or rather just the Western American vibe of franchises like the Skylanders, but it did come with Sonic Boom Rise of Lyric, which just turned out to be a poor man's version of Jack and Dexter, a franchise Sonic really has no business in trying to copy. This whole Sonic Boom project was meant to reboot Sonic under a new light, which far too many franchises were trying to do during this time, such as Crash Bandicoot. It at least came with a TV show that I actually quite enjoy, even if it is grossly different from who Sonic is. Then we had Sonic Forces, which at first glance may seem to be reverting Sonic back to what worked with colors and generations, but it also took on a heavy war aesthetic, which I can't help but think is inspired by games such as Fortnite and Overwatch, especially when you take the custom avatar into account. Sonic Mania is technically in line with the true identity of Sonic, but you can also argue that this game was brought on by the nostalgia trend that was occurring around this time. And then we have Sonic Frontiers, which was front and back marketed as a Breath of the Wild clone from the first day, all the way down to the environments and the music being used for the game. To me, the overall theme of these years of Sonic was just throwing a bunch of darts at the board until something stuck. But then, something changed. A vibration in the tectonic plates, a change in the Earth's orbit. As Sam Cooke once said, the change is gonna come, and boy, it did. This whole decade and a half post-adventure is just filled with very fragile sense of identity when it comes to Sonic. With Sega thinking Sonic has to be molded and adapted to whatever is popular at the time in order for Sonic to get by. And I don't know, I have to say, after years of trying to support Sonic through all this, I couldn't help but feel a little fatigued as a fan. I personally dropped out of this franchise entirely from the announcement of Sonic Lost World up until the release of Forces, and I just couldn't be bothered to continue trying to stay on a sinking ship, you know? But Sonic always has a way of reeling me in one way or another, and I can only think Sonic's pure appeal is the reason why he is still standing here today despite so many missteps, which is why I'm pleased to say things begin to look up from this point on. One aspect I think is a huge contributing factor to this is of course the movie franchise. And if anything, the movie franchise is actually a perfect visual representation of what changed with Sonic and why Sega actually finally gets it. So if we start from the first movie, we find the exact same problem that Sega has been having with Sonic when we go all the way back to the very beginning to when yes, that initial Sonic movie design came out. I don't know what the fuck Paramount and maybe even Sega were trying to mimic with that design, but it clearly struck a chord in the worst ways possible, creating a reaction that seems to be the epitome of the mismanagement of Sonic from the past decade and a half. But you know what changed? The higher ups actually listened for a second. They took the feedback and actually acted on it in a meaningful way by retooling the design and delaying the movie. You know how common that actually is in the industry? Like zilch, nada, especially with Hollywood movies. As for the movie itself, while the design certainly increased its appeal, for me personally, the movie felt like it was still trying to mimic the classic Hollywood blockbuster hit, rather than truly relying on, again, the essence of Sonic and letting that be the selling factor. I mean, it was fine for the time. Sonic has never had a theatrical movie in this way before, so I can understand them why to play it safe, especially given that initial reaction. But then we get to the second Sonic movie, and that's when something shifts. You see, I recently re-watched Sonic 2 while I was at PAX West in Seattle, and laying on that bed and taking in that movie for what it was, it truly clicked to me why I like this one so much more than the first one. This is a movie that introduces a lot of staple Sonic lore into the universe such as Knuckles and the Chaos Emeralds. And the way that the movie was written really puts a spotlight on classic Sonic lore and themes that I grew up loving as a child. The second movie felt much more willing to rely on what the integral parts of Sonic's identity was, rather than being concerned with incorporating more trends and plot lines than most blockbuster movies contain. I mean, it wasn't perfect. As much as I love Rachel, I do think the movie spent a little too much time on her disaster of a wedding, but I digress. This second movie was one of the first times in a while I felt Sonic was actually proud of his history and that the writers were fully embracing what made Sonic cool in the first place, which was this carefree attitude battling against great and epic stakes worthy of a blockbuster hit. And have you seen the third movie trailer? Cause if you haven't, maybe you shouldn't because it almost gave me cardiac arrest. This movie trailer is showing me that the franchise is continuing to move in the direction of embracing Sonic's true essence through a beautiful marriage of high stakes and attitude, aggressively relying on longtime Sonic lore to sell a new kind of story to the general masses. I was absolutely hyped and flabbergasted watching this trailer and to me, it really feels like a love letter to the Sonic I grew to love as a kid. And that Sonic is no longer trying to please
these non-fans. Sonic is finally comfortable being marketed as who he is, and this movie trailer is a huge indicator of that. And on the video game side of things, Sonic and Shadow Generations is taking that same approach, allowing Sonic to be as edgy and dark as he wants through the lens of Shadow while still maintaining the attitude and spunkiness of the adventure games. I mean, do you think Sega 10 years ago would have thought to bring back Black Doom for a project like this? Absolutely not. Everything about Shadow Generations truly feels like Sega is using all the best aspects of Sonic to craft and market a major title instead of relying on whatever hot thing is big at the moment and trying to squeeze into that niche space. That's not to say Sonic shouldn't experiment, but there's a difference between, say, Mario incorporating a hat mechanic into Odyssey to expand upon his 3D mechanics versus Sonic creating his own Breath of the Wild. One franchise is bending the mechanic to its own will, while the other is bending its own skin and bones to the mechanic right down to the aesthetic. Shadow Generations really seems to me like a game truly proud of its history in a much bigger way than Generations felt like. And it's just great to see Sonic reclaim his core identity in this way. We can talk about things like, oh well, but the gameplay might still suck and well, I'll just say one step at a time. Sonic isn't going anywhere and I'm going to celebrate every victory he has as someone who wants nothing more than to see this franchise prosper for the rest of my life. I really do feel like the movies gave Sega the wake up call that people love Sonic as he is and that focusing on his streams and maybe incorporating some new ideas here and there is truly the key to success rather than sculpting and molding Sonic into whatever whack ass idea they got from last year's bestseller. And without those movies, I can totally picture what would have happened instead. What would have happened is something very similar to what's happening to Katy Perry right now. You thought I'd forgotten, didn't you? No, no, no. So I'm sure you're all aware, but Katy Perry was one of the defining artists of the 2010s, releasing her magnum opus, Teenage Dream, which is one of two albums that has five number one hits. I mean, that's pretty good, you gotta admit. But afterwards, and this actually is around the same time as Sonic's Mario and Clone era, Katy's career has seen one of the sharpest declines I think the music industry has ever seen. Going from every single of hers hitting the top five to not even being able to chart with her latest ones. And what has led to this point you may ask? Well here's where I'll bring it back to Sonic in a bit. Sega could have very well led Sonic down this pathway if they had continued adopting the mindset that Katy Perry currently has. I've heard a lot of do this, don't say that, wear less, wear more now, hey, don't cut your hair. One of the biggest reasons I'm standing here right now is I learned how to block out all the noise that every single artist in this industry has to constantly fight against, especially women. I just want to say with my whole heart, do whatever it takes to stay true to yourself and true to your art. Turn off social media, safeguard your mental health, pause, touch grass. So Katie really emphasizes the importance of blocking out the noise in social media and just enjoying life the way it was always meant to be enjoyed. And while I certainly can empathize with that as someone who makes content and doesn't love every single comment he gets, a level of self-awareness is also quite valuable. And you simply cannot have that if you're always blocking it out. You see, the reason Katie is really in hot water this year is because she decided Decided to work with a producer named Dr. Luke, who is a very well known alleged. And well, I'm not going to go much deeper into that as I think you understand the only reason Katie thought it would be remotely okay to do this is because she is stuck in her own little bubble and is completely unaware of how stupid of an idea this was due to that. And for a long while, Sega was in that same exact predicament. The difference with Sega's management of Sonic though is that they were somewhat tuned into what the public was thinking, but only the public that wasn't their fan base. Sega was stuck for almost two decades trying to chase trends with Sonic from Shadow's gunplay, Unleash's beat em up mechanics, all the way up to the vast green open world of Frontiers, there was a severe lack of confidence in the brand of Sonic himself. And I do feel that the turning point, at least from what I can see, was that initial Sonic movie design. And Sega really opened their ears to their fans and actually did something in response to that. And look at the result. What I'm really trying to say with this analogy is that self-awareness is a powerful superhero ability in this world. And if you're able to balance out that self-awareness with a reasonable way in taking that in and fleshing it out on your own output, that's one of the true keys to success in this world. We're seeing it with Sonic, and man, do I wish we'd finally see it with Katy Perry.
Anyway, y'all, that's going to wrap it up today, but I hope you can tell that for once, I'm actually very, very positive about the outlook of Sonic, and I gotta say, for most of my life as a Sonic fan, I couldn't really say that. So I'm proud of Sega, I'm proud of what we're doing, and like I said, I can only hope that other people and companies follow suit. But let me know your thoughts in the comment section below, and also let me know what your thoughts on the upcoming Sonic projects. I'd love to hear them, and just, uh, yeah. Stay cool, stay blue, and uh, this is Riders riding out.